Welcome, everyone. This will be a cozy session, so it's very good. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Paola Valencia, and I'm the director of the Home of Blockchain. We are a public-private um, organization. Let me change here. I have to. I cannot change the. So we are a public-private organization, and um, we started by. We got the mandate from the Ministry of Finance for Switzerland, of Switzerland, the former. Uh, let me see, one second, I'm just checking here. So this is a pro one, okay, there we go. So my name is Paola Valencia, and welcome to our course section, or basically a master class on what Web3 can do to improve con the social conditions of people on these SDGs. The last days we have been listening a lot about all the problems that we have, a lot of impact investments um, and funds, etc. But I mean, it's also very important to understand that technology can play a really important role. And we will demystify a, li a little bit what blockchain means, what Web3 means. And these are some of my, uh, I'm very uh, happy to present my co-organizers, Alvaro Cosi from the U Switzerland for UNHCR, and Alexander Massa from the Cardano Foundation. There we go. So today I have just quickly some words. We will have a panel presentation, uh, some final thoughts, and an invitation for an event afterwards. So welcome. So, so we are in Switzerland, which is a very special place. Uh, we were voted just recently as the number one, the Human Freedom Index. Uh, we are also, for the 13th year, the most innovative country in the world. We have a long tradition of humanitarian aid, uh, and also, you can see, I mean, we have this responsible innovation spirit. That means that we, it's not like in the U.S., you go fast and break things. No, we look on how the technology we develop can have a positive impact on the people. And as you know, Switzerland doesn't have much of um, natural resources, so it's very important to work together with other countries and uh, we are friends with all the world, so it's a very particular place in Geneva, a special place for all these organi international organizations. So here again, we will touch the subject of crypto. We were voted number one in the latest um, poll uh, that was around the world, and, uh, because we have great people, we have regulations, and uh, our government is, has these gr grassroots, so they don't dictate the laws, the things come up and are adapted. So I'm very, I'm very happy to welcome um, my panel, which is Frederick Grega from the Cardano Foundation, Florian Rice from Kryptonite Asset Management, Carmen Kate from UNHCR, Ahmed Amer from uh, the CEO from Emurgo Africa, and we have Omar Bawa from the CEO and co-founder from Goose Wall. So if you could join me to the, to the stage, please. And just so before we start, we all have heard and everybody is thinking that maybe blockchain was a book, this buzzword, a hype, and now the new hype is artificial intelligence. Just so you know, artificial intelligence, the first neural papers are from 1943. And then until now, we have the emergence of this technology and everybody is going up. And now, blockchain is just a little bit older than a decade. And it can also play a very, very important role into identities, um, into having this vault of secure, untampered information. So don't leave it there. And while it's quiet, it's evolving. So let's hear a little bit more about it. And um, so I will move my location. So welcome again. And um, we have heard a lot about blockchain and everybody thinks that it has to do with crypto and maybe Ponzi schemes. And I would like that we talk a little bit what is Web3 and what is a blockchain. I think taxonomy is very important to demystify all these 
wrong or good ideas or what is behind. And we have the great opportunity to have Frederick Gregert, who explain us a little bit what is blockchain, what is the Cardano Foundation, what makes, makes it special. Thank you. That's a, that's a big opening question, huh? What is blockchain? <laughs> All right, so the way I normally think about a blockchain is that a blockchain is, um, is a big magical Excel spreadsheet. And what's magical about the Excel spreadsheet is that for the first time we can have multiple different entities who work in the same sheet with a very good activity log. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because everything we do today is in data. You know, whether we like it or not, uh, our whole life is in a database somewhere. So the ability for somebody to change that data uh, about our life is there and is present at every given moment. And now we spend about 200 years to try and figure out and uh, build institutions who ensure that we cannot change that data. And uh, that's been working up until this point. But as data is exponentially growing all the time, the likelihood that we won't catch those changes or that those changes are relevant uh, is simply too high. The second part is that normally what we do with these Excel spreadsheets is we protect them. We protect them from other people seeing the data, because it's our intellectual property right. But if they can't see it, they can't verify it either. That means that there's no way to do a third party control without actually us sort of dictating the scope of the control, including where they have to look. But it also makes it very hard to, uh, you know, to collaborate across borders and across cultures and just us as humans. So what this uh, does, the blockchain, is it allows everybody to collaborate in the same spreadsheet under the same rules with no single person or institution being able to change the rules as we go along. And that means that it's a fantastic place to basically you know, include the 1.1 billion people who don't have an identity today. Because you know, obviously, it should be the nation state or the community in where they live who should give them that opportunity to have identity papers. But as they haven't done it up until now, we, for the first time, give them an opportunity to create an identity. Now, is it as good as it would have been if it would be from the nation state? Well, probably not, but it will have some different features. It also allows us to sort of change the way we collaborate among one large entity and multiple small entities. So what we saw is, for instance, Mask, uh, the last shipping giant, they built a fantastic um, trading, uh, trade fi system for containers and, and, and so forth uh, on a blockchain. But because they sort of had priority rights over the blockchain, none of the competitors wanted to join. So even though the technology was great, well, nobody joined and they basically closed it down. So a true public permissionless blockchain has a couple of features. It's immutable, you can't just change the data. It allows everybody at equal base to contribute, participate, and be a part of it. And it also has no sort of um, relationship asymmetries, right? So, and, and that basically changes the architecture of the internet from a place where you only transact in information to you can now transact in value across all time zones, all communities, and all sites of businesses and industries. And I guess we have Web 1, which is which just giving us information, Web 2, which is what we know with Facebook, where we became the data, and we, so Web3 is basically the blockchain is allowing us to re recover our data. Yeah, so that was a very good question. Again, huh? Paula, you're on a run here, huh? Um, so the blockchain is sort of a bit of a boring, a little bit stupid database system. So it, it doesn't, it's not very intelligent, and that's very good. So you can do both of that, right? So you could protect and do what many people dream of with a self-sovereign identity, but a self-sovereign identity would never work if the current institutions and the current regulatory framework we're operating on doesn't accept it. So think about it like that. If I create an identity on the blockchain, if you don't accept that identity or the regulator or whatever kind of counterpart who's going to do it, don't accept it, well, sorry, no chance. Huh? So I think identity is a very, very hard topic. But for the first time, we now have something who looks and feels like standards, where the individual has the power of their own data and has possibilities of, of basically 
I wouldn't say tokenizing, but have the ability to control their own data and their own data footprint, which, by the way, is very aligned with the uh, general data protection laws and regulations who's coming in effect all over the world at the moment. Huh? It's just changing completely how we think about it. Very good. I have uh, normally also we listen about the blockchain, the theme of energy, and as we are talking about sustainability and so on, can you talk a little bit about blockchain and energy? Because I guess so many people will say, oh, but it uses a lot of energy. Yeah, so I was just in the European Parliament last week and um, I was saying to them, this is the first time in several months somebody asked me about blockchain and energy. And I was sort of laughing with them and said, this is nearly irrelevant right now. And now I'm entering here today and you're asking me the same question. So it's, a, it's kind of interesting that this doesn't go away. But the, 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 Mac, you know, the, the fact are quite simple. For the first time ever, we have actually the true footprint of an exponential technology's energy consumption in Bitcoin. That means that we know more or less down to the, to, to the every vet hour what it takes to operate that financial market infrastructure with Bitcoin is. We can then discuss whether there should have had more asset classes or more identities, is it too much and too little? But this is the first time we have transparency. And you know what, when you have transparency of something, you can put a line in the sand and say this is our benchmark. Now the next question we then ask ourselves is, well, what about you know, UBS? What about Morgan Stanley? You know, what about, I mean, the Google of the world? You know, when everybody loves to have a free Gmail address, does people actually know what kind of electricity consumption and what kind of silicon footprint that has? Because what actually people don't realize is that the electricity consumption is only one part of the equation. There is so much toxic waste coming out of these CPUs who's burning out, which is basically dumped in landfills and, you know, it's going to, t you know, make the earth toxic, right? So it's even worse than we think. But the fact that we, for the first time, have a way to have full transparency and have a way to look at it in a supply chain way is basically changing the way we thought we were measuring and the hypothesis around doing these measuring systems. And I think, you know, from Cardano's aspect, we've always been very, uh, you know, sustainable. So, I mean, the, we work in a complete different security fashion from Bitcoin. So we work on what's called a proof of stake blockchain and we use like one to a million times the amount of energy like Bitcoin does. And we have a complete different also silicon waste footprint and so forth. But for us, what's interesting is that we are now able to work with industries from finance to agriculture ensuring that they can start measuring that sustainability footprint and the footprint, the services and goods they have. And we can start sort of, you know, paying attention to is this good or is that bad? And is there somewhere across that, you know, sustainability footprint that they can be optimized? Because now we can start trusting the data who's coming in from the sensors and from the different entities because they can work on a common database. And I think that is really the essence. So, and I think that's what people have to pay attention to, that we actually have the technology now. The question is, are we so scared that we're not using it? Because it, there's really no reason for not using it. So it's not a financial question anymore. It's not a technical question anymore. Now it's just a question of, are people really truly willing to look the truth in the eyes and say hi to the dragon? Because that means that we will change the way we operate businesses. It's a very good comment. Just so you know, I, as the way I promote Switzerland as a hub for blockchain technology involves finding the best examples and talking about with them around the world. And sometimes I do find companies which have great use cases, but they don't want to talk about it because they cannot be sure that they can really show the transparency of the whole supply chain and that's why they are not adopting it. So we have the tools really to bring transparency and traceability, but is your organization willing to be transparent? That's a big, big question. We will come back because there are many, many things. I mean, you, you well, very quickly. The Cardano Foundation is one of the organizations we work closest because the type of values, they also are very close to the Swiss values that we have of decentralization. And we are educating, and the Cardano Foundation is very active in going to the parliaments of different countries and really educating the people that it's not about crypto, Ponzi schemes, and so on. This is a 
way to bring transparency and it brings a lot of positive um, um, outcomes of, of using technology and connecting more people. We'll go back to, to Cavano, but now that we are through going a little bit into finance, I would like to talk a little bit with uh, Florian Reis, which is uh, the CEO and founder of Kryptonite Asset Management. And I want him to speak a little bit about the future of finance. Thank you. So, uh, when I started Kryptonite six years ago, I come from the traditional um, banking industry. And two things stroke me. First of all, 25 years ago, everything that had to do with now is called impact investing had no interest. Nobody was really interested in investing in a sustainable way, trying to do something more than just money. The whole narrative was, I give you money, make me more money. Okay, bit of dull, but it, it is. Today, it's a generational change. You talk to someone who is, you know, depending on the, on the variation of things, but you talk to someone who is less than 40, he will tell you, I want my investments to mean something. And, and that is fundamentally different than it was before. So why kryptonite? Why blockchain? Why crypto? When I started crypto, there was one narrative which was fascinating. I had some traditional banker, still today, they ask me, why should I care about investing into crypto? Well, my, my answer is always the same thing. You should have cared 25 years ago to invest in the internet because at the time, what was said about the internet? You mentioned twice the word Ponzi. Interesting. Ponzi, scam, fraud, you know, drug dealers and everything. And today you hear the same thing with crypto. People forget it's the tree that hides the forest. This is not the point. We are going, we are seeing now, if we pay attention, we're seeing what crypto blockchain is able to, to do. What is in bringing to finance? So I make my point, and then you understand there's a logic perhaps, is to say, I want my investment to matter. So I want my return to matter. But if I can't see it, if I'm not sure where my money is going, where if I'm not sure who's using my money, my resources, anything I do, how can I know that my money matters, right? Blockchain, crypto, all the technology that we're talking about, traceability, transparency, unchangeability of data and actions, this is what matter. You can actually say to someone, I will take your money, we will invest into this, it will have an impact, it will change real life of real people. Identity, digital identity, only this very simple thing. We have a passport, it's ours. Okay, sure, I show it. But the problem is, for most of the people on this planet, this is the simplest things to do, not. Because they don't have the document, they lose it, they change it, they are desperate to recover it. With blockchain, you can solve this. It's one of the zillions applications, and this has a direct link to, to finance. That was very interesting. And maybe so that everybody understands, what is a digital asset? That's a very good question. Digital assets, it means everything and nothing in our uh, concept because it's a mixed bag of things. People, it's exactly the same thing as people say, oh, I don't like crypto, but I like blockchain. Okay, so it's a little bit like saying, oh, I love the internet, but I hate the web. Or I like the internet, but I do not like the FTTP, you know, protocol. You can't, you know, it's the whole bag. True. Some crypto, some digital assets are worthless, but you know what? Let the market decide which one has a use case, which one is an 
of use and which one is not. This is what we are seeing now. So we're talking a lot about tokens, about coins, about, uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of concepts that needs to be proven. We are in an infancy of a technology. Let's not forget that this thing, and I on purpose call it a thing, was invented in 2009 from people that I always refer to kind of the Woodstock of finance, right? You had a bunch of guys that were very upset about the financial crisis and the impact it had. And they say, well, we're going to create something that could possibly replace this dollar that has suddenly you know, fluctuations and will eventually disappear, according to them. And look at what happened. It evolved. It has use cases. It has different topics, different subjects, different applications. And if someone tells me that, oh, I do not believe in the impact of crypto as a currency. I say, hang on, what about the person in Nigeria who can today trade with a person in Vietnam in four seconds without intermediaries, without excessive fees, without any of the layer that has been applied to this transaction in the past? Those two individuals or companies of group of people can now transact. I mean, if this is not a positive impact of a crypto or currency, well, I don't know what impact really means. Absolutely. I, I am I'm Swiss, but I'm also Mexican, and I was depending of sending as a student that I will get money sent by via SWIFT, and I remember the anxiety I will have sometimes. I will be one, two weeks, and my money has not arrived, and nobody knows here, nobody knows there, and now, I mean, it's nothing. Just last week, uh, the Swiss National Bank, together with the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Bank de France and the Bank of International Settlements, they finished the project, um, the first pilot with the Project Mariana, in which they exchanged money using the blockchain, and it had very positive results because even on the level of the Swiss National Bank, of the ba national banks, just the, the, the possibility of being able to send the money like immediately, well, sending is just the exchange of the information, but in a secure and with the traceability, it makes a whole difference. Of course, there are some challenges that will come, but I mean, there were, and, they see that working together, they can also bring some impact. And yeah, I mean, I left, I, I felt this impact. We don't have to go to lots of uh, the global south. I mean, just between Germany and Switzerland, where I had to these issues of waste my money, <laughs> which are highly advanced. I, I, I left it very, very good. And um, just so we can continue. Um, Switzerland has traditionally uh, a, a history of, as, uh, of custody for banking and so on. And I think we also have this know-how for digital assets for the custody, because obviously all the scandals we listen about these disappear and so on have been in other locations. We don't have these type of scandals in Switzerland. Can you talk a little bit about the custody? The, the, what is the secret sauce of Switzerland on the custody? Is it the regulations or what is it? What, what makes us special? Well. I think that you know, in two aspects of, of, I mean, Switzerland in regards to digital assets, first of all, one, for once, um, uh, Switzerland has been a pioneer in, in, in accepting and embracing this, uh, this crypto blockchain kind of, of, of evolution uh, very early on. So, um, so Finma was very active into this, and as you showed on your slide, then Zug as an ecosystem has, has grown tremendously. And today, what we hope, that's why also we went to FINMA for, to be regulated, because for our understanding, for, you know, it, we come from traditional finance, it's impossible to conceive that we could have an offer in cryptocurrency or you know, digital assets, asset management, if you are not regulated and you don't bring a solutions for what matters the most to people, you mentioned custody, Absolutely. Uh, you have to traceability, accountability. This is where Switzerland has to play its role, and it does. Uh, you have some technology companies that have emerged to, to produce, you know, Metaco, Taurus, that have, are providing now security in custody for, for those digital assets. And you capitalize on what Switzerland image is. 
what we wish to have, um, you know, if you make a small wish list, is, is to say it is for us a bit of a, you know, puzzling. From 30 years onward, what happened in America for investment management, alternative investments, private equity, venture funds, has come here with a, with a delay. And today, it is exactly the same thing. Overseas, you have crypto asset management portfolios, mandates, traditional banks are embracing it. Even the regulations is, let's say, not clear, but you still have a massive effect. Here, we still have a distinct between what I would like to do and what I would not like to do. We separate TreadFi and digital assets. Mm -hmm. We believe that our the project and the way to encourage people to trust this environment is actually to link it with an impact investment base. Because then you can say to people, this is a unique feature of what you can do with your investments. And back to my first point, traceability and view of what you can do. Yeah, and we see that there's more adoption just la last week. Uh, it was real that, I mean, we have now traditional banks that are uh, really going into this direction, the uh, Turkey Cantonal Bank, uh, the Bern Cantonal Bank. So we see more and more adoption. You mentioned impact. I saw that you are, have this real, real, real fee. Yeah, the, the real FI. So real FI. <laughs> in a nutshell, this real FI initiative, which was brought by some people close to us, and it was basically to say, there is micro lending in this world. That's not new, right? But micro lending, what is it? You have funds that invest into sub funds that invest into other local entities that will deploy some capital to the end user who actually needs this money to, to run his business and to grow. Problem, you don't have any traceability because you don't really know where the money is going and especially at the last mile. So the idea was to say, in Africa, as an example, everything is digitalized. So it's very, it's easier to have traceability of the money from, the, you know, to the end. But what is the impact? The person who receives the microloan, if he's diligent because he's a serious person, he wants to grow his business, he wants to grow his wealth for his family and to have an impact on his regional, he will benefit from the traceability because his positive behavior will reflect, will be verifiable. So he will receive more capital and more investments because he's a diligent person. The one who will run a Ponzi will be automatically seen and gone. That is to say, serious people who want to do good, who wants to have a plan to grow, should receive more. And this was not possible before we had this in place. Thank you. So this is, brings you to our next um, speaker, Carmen Head, who is the treasurer from the UNHCR, which actually I try to invite her or to involve her in whatever big event I have, because we talk a lot about climate change, we have conflicts, and we, I, I come from Mexico, so you probably have heard about the US and uh, Mexico and migrants and refugees. We have refugees in Poland. I work a lot with Poland. And I mean, we turn on the TV and now we hear Armenia and we hear about uh, Libya and uh, natural catastrophe. And I always have to think in Carmen and the, the team from the UNHCR, like, how can we help uh, these people? And they have all the expertise and they're very active on innovation and looking for, for new solutions. And I was extremely surprised to see how active they are in technology. And I would like her to talk a little bit about how blockchain, how is it helping all these, uh, these, these emergencies because you live in a state of emergency. Exactly. So the key is that uh, UNHCR, so you might be surprised that uh, one of these UN agencies is actually using blockchain and digital currency, but uh, we are full into this and we have a lot of people that we serve. So 
Some of you might know we have a record amount of people on the move, so there are about 110 million uh, forcibly displaced and more to come every day as we are watching the news. So we need to have solutions that really provide a platform that we can provide aid assistance as and when needed. And obviously with speed, with transparency, traceability, and obviously also to make sure that we can do the reporting to our donor base dollar by dollar. And to that extent, we have now a use case for disbursements for disbursements into Ukraine, and uh, it's live, it's introduced, and we are looking for scalability. The, the solution is built on the blockchain, and it involves a digital wallet, a non-custodial wallet, and from that wallet, um, we, have, uh, we have fully uh, incorporated uh, design options for the person of concern, the recipients, to be able to withdraw or utilize, consume the funds on that particular wallet. Uh, currently, we have a bridge between digital and fiat in the case of Ukraine, and also facility to be able to transfer money direct to their existing accounts. So we can confirm today that uh, this technology does work. Um, we have traceability, accountability, but I think above all, we have to trust so the trust element for the donor community, but also for the recipients to actually be able to, to depend on, on that modality, which is the digital wallet modality, how to receive uh, humanitarian aid. We can maybe come back to the other slide. At the same time, so UNHCR having solutions in place for outflows, so to reach our beneficiaries, recipients, but also our colleagues at uh, UNHCR or Switzerland for UNHCR, the foundation, also has embarked on fundraising of a special kind using a staking pool, in this case ADA, Cardano ADA, and it gives the rewards back to UNHCR for its programs and also for innovative uh, refugee-derived projects. So to that extent, you can argue here that this is, a very, this is a very direct way that anyone in the community on the crypto side of things actually can participate and uh, assign the rights of staking directly to that pool for the benefit of the rewards for UNHCR. So this is a very special way of fundraising and also reach people that we would ordinarily not reach. So I think that this technology also offers huge possibilities for each and every one of us, if you haven't yet gone and given us a donation, actually to participate, whether you are in the crypto space or not, but in, if you are in the crypto space, you can actually directly uh, have an impact through the staking pool. Furthermore, we also, or the colleagues from Switzerland for UNHCR Foundation, also engaged into NFTs to raise the awareness through the technology and to make sure, again, the community is reached, so some of it can also go back into the staking pool, but more so, the NFT is not here to be tradable, and it's not a security, but the key is that it actually demonstrates and raises the awareness for UNHCR that we can fundraise in such a way, and it's also, it has, if you like, it has a little bit the cool factor as well, so the key is as we go to, to big events, we can actually create our own NFTs and raise really awareness that you know, anyone who wants to give us a donation, we are really open for, for receiving donation. So it's very powerful to link on one side how we fundraise through these mechanisms, through using the blockchain, through staking, through NFTs, but also actually that we have that direct link for the funds also to be able to go out, out in a traceable way, like I explained, on the blockchain, using digital currency. So in this case here, we're using a stable coin, USDC, and is then converted into fiat. So it's probably a bit counterintuitive to have a fiat bridge on a, on a digital structure, 
But nevertheless, I think this is early days and that gives us good learnings how we actually can be much faster, much more prepared in any emergency, humanitarian, climate-wise, otherwise. So, and it's also for other UN agencies, NGOs, to be able to use that channel. And we have already one of the UN agencies also using that particular channel. So we having that effect that we have our financial gateway for humanitarian aid, and it could even be humanitarian, development, it could, it could go much further and to build uh, innovative financial solution, we were talking about innovation, to have different ways of actually raising funds. This is, and we go back to this generational change which uh, Florian was mentioning. We have new people, I mean when the conflict with Ukraine, we saw that there was uh, an increase on crypto donations to help Ukrainian and then it could be like done really fast and you have to wait one week and, and so on. So this is, this is great. I think we have to go very quickly back to between, also with, um, with Frederick about the staking. This, because it, this is a very innovative way of fundraising. Could you just between Carmen and Fred, could you go a little bit like how does it work for in a, in a very easy language, do I, I put my ADA, but what is ADA, so? Yeah, so it's quite simple. Uh, there's something called proof of contribution, which is how all blockchains operate to ensure that the cryptographic primitives are matured and ensuring that nobody can do fraud on the chain. When I say fraud on the chain, it's not so much the use case, it's more about changing the data. And with Bitcoin, I think everybody sort of realized that the, the, the proof of contribution there mainly is around electricity and compute power. With Cardano, which is a proof of stake blockchain, and there's many different implementations of proof of stake, the actual proof of contribution is trust. So it's our ability to trust each other as a social system who actually you know, uses game theory to secure the blockchain. And a lot of people get really worried about that, you know, because then it's, you know, before we were speaking about what is a digital asset, and now I'm actually moving into what is trust and digital trust. But uh, we've been around for a quite long time. We have four or five million people on the blockchain every uh, single day. So it's, um, it, it really works well. But to do that, we have this concept that you can do a voting mechanism. So if you have some of our utility tokens, which is called ADA, which is sort of the entry to use the computing power, of Cardano to do an NFT or to interact with a smart contract, what you can do is you can participate in the security of the blockchain by saying, I trust a validator more than I trust another validator. And that's very unique in the way Cardano does it because there's no lock-in period, there's no slashing, and there's no ownership change. And what's really unique about that is that from a regulatory perspective, specifically in the US, Europe, and, and Asia, that changes the aspect of staking dramatically. So you go into your wallet or you go to your bank and you say, I would like to um, vote or stake to UNHCR because that is definitely the best pool out there and it gives social impact. And what basically means is that they will direct to the blockchain that uh, your registered wallet would now stake with the amount of ADA you have, but your ADA is full under your control. They're fully liquid and you can turn that off within you know, a, a, a click of a button. So it's quite different than what Ethereum has implemented and other blockchains has. So in essence, by participating in making the blockchain secure and open to all, you can then also participate in doing alternative fundraising to UNHCR. UNHCR is running a validator node, which basically means that they are also contributing to the security of the Cardano blockchain. And there is no contractual link between UNHCR and the actual sort of stake pool, a stake delegator. Why I'm saying that is because it's very important, specifically in the Swiss context right now, uh, where FINMA is looking into different ways of staking, and this is quite unique and it ticks all the boxes it needs to tick. Thank you very much. So we are talking about empowering communities. I would like to talk with uh, Ahmed Amer, who is the CEO from um, Emorgo Africa. Can you tell us just very quickly what is Emorgo and uh, what are you doing to contribute and empower startups? What are you doing in Africa? Sure, thank you. Um, so 
Uh, we're very close with Cardano. Uh, you can think of Emergo as the investment and commercial arm of Cardano. So we do a lot of the investment um, associated with uh, VC activities, but also our MO is to grow blockchain adoption globally by um, uh, alleviating a lot of the barriers that are associated with blockchain. Um, so we're focused on emerging markets, Africa being one of the big uh, places we focus in. And uh, in order to really draw a clear picture of what we do, maybe I can, I can help by explaining um, the adverse effects of the current uh, Ukraine war, for instance. Um, the Ukraine war has caused uh, a global macroeconomic effect that's you know, affected all countries, from developed to emerging to frontier. Um, here in Europe, you know, we see uh, the ECB constantly rising interest, raising interest rates. Uh, we see the Fed in the United States raising interest rates as well. Um, that in itself has uh, really grave effects on currencies of emerging markets. Uh, emerging markets have lost between 40% to 200% of their currency value in the last two years. Um, and if I'm a uh, kiosk owner in Kenya, um, immediately I'm operating on you know, a few dollars a day. That immediately slashes my wealth. Um, in addition to that, I don't have access to healthcare. Uh, I don't have access to finance my business. I don't have access to the basics and necessities that you know, a normal human being anywhere should be afforded. So um, in addition to that, um, inflation is you know, rising through the roof here in Europe, but even more so in emerging markets. Um, there are uh, numbers as high as 120% rates of inflation in a lot of these emerging markets and economies. Um, lack of foreign currency, lack of foreign capital, inability to draw on or attract raw material to build specific basic you know, FMCGs, foods. Um, and so the opportunity of blockchain coming in is huge in a lot of sectors. Earlier you mentioned when you were trying to send money from Mexico to Switzerland, it was a struggle. Um, it still is a struggle for a lot of people. Um, uh, especially in countries or economies where money um, is, is, is a lot weaker than it used to be. Um, and so one of the things we see a lot of opportunity in is fintech payments. Um, uh, one of the companies we invested in early on are a company that do uh, something, something called remittances, which is basically uh, the repatriation of money from expat communities to their homeland. Um, and, uh, an example I like to use is a company called Afriax. Um, they do crypto wallets, and we invested in them 10 months ago, um, and their valuation has tripled since because of the sheer amount of money they can move from Belgium, Holland, the UK, to Côte d'Ivoire, to Senegal, to Nigeria, where people are sending money uh, back home. Um, Stable coins are another uh, really, really powerful tool. Um, some of my fellow panelists mentioned it here earlier. Uh, when you have a country that has a, a declining currency in value, it makes the cost of import significantly higher. And we've seen that recently in um, a lot of emerging markets. Debt is in foreign capital, USD, Euro, Yen, Yuan, which, whatever it is. And with constant devaluations, this debt level increases substantially, 2x, 3x. Some countries now, since the Ukraine war, their debt ceiling has, has almost surpassed their global their GDP. And so when we introduce things like stable coins that reduce the exposure of their local currencies and the flow of US capital or foreign capital outside of their economies, it's a really, really impactful solution. Um, other areas we've also looked at are things like digital identity. Um, in a lot of emerging markets, people lack digital identities, or people lack identities in the first place. So utilizing things like mobile penetration, which is over 100% in a lot of African countries, um, due to something called M-Pesa. M-Pesa is something that was de de developed 15, 20 years ago in Kenya and East Africa, and basically allowed everyone to have a mobile wallet. You can buy a beer with a mobile wallet, you can buy a car, you can get married, you can buy furniture. And so arming people who have mobile wallets with access to liquidity, access to finance, access to SME lending to grow their businesses using stable coins, using um, digital identities that sit on chain for verification, for privacy concerns, is an extremely powerful tool. Um, and so we're utilizing this you know, impact of young population, 
uh, uh, highly connected folks through mobile penetration, um, to educate folks on becoming, uh, you know, able to connect to this, you know, global world we live in using the technology of blockchain. No, very interesting. So you know, I mean, we're listening to all these advances in Africa. We are catching up in Switzerland. Huh? We have in Lugano. Now you can pay in a McDonald's also with your digital wallet. So we are working on it. So very good. I like the, the, the idea of impact, young people, education. And I think, if I'm not wrong, one of the startups you have invested in is Goodwall. That's correct. Correct? Absolutely. Yep. So I would like to listen a little bit about um, Goodwall with Omar Baba, who is the co-founder and chief operating officer. Yes. And um, so, I mean, one of the things, I, I, I love technology. In, in particular, artificial intelligence, not because it's now the hype word. I've done my models in 2019, so I know a little bit about it. And, um, and I know the risks. I was here at the AI for Good in this, uh, this room, and we were discussing all these ethical issues. And currently, we have this digital divide. There's 2.7 million people in the world which are not connected to the internet. And we can talk about blockchain and many other things, but we have 2.7 million people, billion people which are not connected. So this emergence of AI, which started in 1943, um, is changing everything and it's increasing the digital divide. Even me, I'm not, I'm not paying 20 US dollars for having the advanced GPT, so I'm already getting behind. So now that we have to gain skills, be adaptable, learn, relearn, and so on. And we have young people that is coming, a big generation is reaching. What is Google World doing? Who are you? How come this idea? Well, first of all, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, a huge thank you, Paola, to you and the team for hosting this panel and having us a part of this conversation. Uh, perhaps prior, I'll just give a caveat. Unlike perhaps some of the other panelists, we might be unique in that um, we started as a Web2 company. Um, but you know, thanks to the demonstrated use case, um, and I think the UNHCR with Carmen, Alvaro, and the team, they've you know, really demonstrated a compelling use case for blockchain for good. Even though at Goodwall we're technologists at heart, we've always maybe shied away from buzzwords, whether it's been AI or blockchain or crypto in that sense. The reason why we were maybe drawn in a way, um, and thanks to the support of both the Cardano Foundation, the Cardano ecosystem, and of course, most recently, Emergo, um, to Web 3.0 is we've really recognized the value it can drive in our particular use case um, and in fulfilling our vision of leveling the playing field for youth everywhere. So a little bit of context on Goodwall and what is Goodwall prior to maybe touching on um, some of your other questions. At Goodwall, we're building a skills-based social network for Gen Z to learn and earn. You can think of us almost as a LinkedIn meets TikTok or a LinkedIn for the next generation. Today, we serve around 2 million young people in 150 countries around the world, helping them really navigate their learning and earning journey, starting at the age of 16 and accompanying them all the way to 26, and in some cases, later than that. What we do at Goodwall is our platform and our apps help young people develop their skills, showcase their skills, and then connect to opportunities based on their skills. Why are skills important, especially in this new future of work or education? When you think of it from a macroeconomic perspective today, and you know, Ahmed, I think you touched on it in a bit, there are a billion young people expected to enter the workforce this decade. Of that billion, 90% happen to be from developing or emerging economies. That being said, if you think of the way in which today we value and assess talent, it's based on three, perhaps four criteria. The first is where you're from. The second is your work experience. The third is your education. And the fourth is who you know. This is the case across the board with resumes, CVs, your LinkedIn profile is designed for a world of work that works this way. 
When you think of where you're from, again, the majority of young talent is based in developing economies. If we just take Africa as an example that Ahmed brought up, um, I think the 60% of the population in Africa is aged below 25, 70% below 30. And if we just accelerate to the end of this decade, Africa as a whole should represent almost a larger workforce than the rest of the world combined. Huge untapped potential. But yet for every 11 young Africans who enter the workforce today, only three new jobs that are created, right? Huge talent surplus, big job shortage. Meanwhile, in the global north, big talent shortage um, with an aging population. The second criteria of work experience for young people, catch 22, you need experience to get experience typically. When it comes to your education, you know, if UNESCO's in the room, according to them, less than 38% of youth globally benefit from a higher or privileged education today or secondary education. And fourth, who you know, unless your parents are well connected, more often than not, you're not connected. So by default, your average young person is at a disadvantage when connecting to the right learning and earning opportunities and kickstarting their careers. That's why we're so bullish on skills, because with skills, we're able to value and assess young talent based on their potential and not their pedigree. And yeah, that's what makes us so excited about it and how, why we feel that skills can really play the role of the currency of the future of work and in doing so, help level the playing field for youth everywhere. I mean, we have seen the impact of education. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'm working a lot with Poland, and when you think that in Poland, the access of quality education have made in 20 years uh, a rising technological house of this country. So, I mean, just a little bit of education, it has big, big impact. And sometimes we think on other countries, we, 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 some big companies on technology, are going into, like, I would like to say, digital colonialism. They know better, so they go and say, and I think, actually, we should empower locally because they know better their problems. So, I mean, I think this is where, where you are really reaching. You know, oftentimes, um, yeah, we have, we have this habit of we know better, we'll show better. One thing that we've tried to do differently um, with Goodwall is, empower young people wherever they are in the world, right? I give a concrete example of um, one of the core programs that we run is an entrepreneurship program on a global scale, and this actually ties back to, to Web3, where we're able to both provide a podium for and also fund young people all around the world, giving them a possibility to pitch their ideas virtually using, using their device, and in doing so, strengthen and demonstrate their core skills of creativity, problem solving, and communication. But importantly, and to you know, Cardano's, the Cardano Foundation's mission, it's focused on solving, let's say, some of the world's largest or global problems, but on a very local and grassroots level, because they, contrary to us, understand the problems, right? They're on the front lines of the climate crisis or the migration crisis. And in doing so, we're able to and we're not really talking about massive grants here. We're not looking for the next Elon Musk. We're providing super small micro grants, but at massive scale. You know, today we serve 150 countries. On a weekly basis, we're making transactions in over 100. Um, and to some of the most remote places in the world, most of the youth that we serve are not banked, right? So actually what, what prompted us to you know, even consider the blockchain was this reality of us receiving let's say feedback and sometimes negative reviews, you talked about trust earlier, from youth saying, we won this entrepreneurial prize, et cetera, or we won this challenge on Goodwall, but we still haven't received our funding, or it's been a week, it's been two weeks. And what we noticed was the traditional financial system that we use, whether it's with banking or with PayPal or elsewhere, sometimes it just takes too long or they're just not connected to it. Um, and that's where we see the huge potential in, um, you know, this future of finance. Great. So we're running out of time. I don't know if there's any questions from the audience. Otherwise, I will ask for some. Oh, there's, we have a question there. I don't know if I can. Thank you.
Thank you. Joseph Nyam, Camus Capital. Just a question on proof of concept and pilot case. I can't think of a better ecosystem or pilot case than Lebanon for proof of concept. And I'm wondering what the blockages have been for not having seen it. I mean, to go against a banking system, there is no banking system. To have the biggest refugee per population ratio, it's the largest in the world. It having a population that is highly literate, educated, and mobile dependent, where it's become a barter economy with 95% devaluation. You couldn't think of a better pilot case yet, no matter how much anyone's tried. The Web3 and, and blockchain conversation is just nowhere. What's the blockage there and what has worked elsewhere? Or is the proof of concept more difficult than um, the promise of it? Thank you. Yeah, so I'm not really known for doing proof of concepts. Uh, I think the technology is so mature that you can now already think about implementation from day one. Uh, but a couple of weeks back, I was actually together with the um, Central Bank of Cambodia, and they actually rolled out a CBDC extremely fast and got really good adoption and made like three turnarounds on it uh, to, to really get a lot of young people, but also in general get people to use it on the street. And I asked her, so, you know, how can you run out, uh, how can you basically build a CBDC for the Central Bank of Cambodia, uh, you know, when the European Union cannot even decide on the, you know, the construct of a, of a CBDC? And she said, you know what? We don't really have anything to lose. So I think what you're onto with Lebanon is a really, really good example. But from where we are standing is that it has to be the people of Lebanon who takes up this educational challenge through Goodwall or through uh, Imurco's educational courses, because the infrastructure is ready to use. Right, uh, but if it cannot be, you know, somebody from Switzerland, you know, pointing their point of view down on how, you know, banking since 500 years has been done in Lebanon. Don't forget, I mean, this is one of the countries who invented banking, huh? So it has to come from them. So I cannot answer the question, but I can tell you that I built a core banking platform with 52 smart contracts, and uh, and three ledgers. So there's nothing hindering us from doing it from a technology perspective. This is only about people. Another question? Uh, yes, we have another one here. Yes, I do. And yes, you know, we, the home of blockchain, the, the organization I represent, we get contacted by some governments when they want, are interested in how to develop also their digital ecosystem. So then we connect them with cantons, with, uh, with the government to get some, a little bit of coaching because Switzerland believes also on competition and sharing the lessons learned. Yes, hello, I'm Francois Bayon. I'm running a small NGO called uh, AHIP about the uh, humanitarian infrastructure. And we have this project in Morocco starting and trying to get like digital connections to uh, end user which have their house destroyed. And, uh, and I'm questioning this, uh, how is the government gonna react to maybe some kind of processes that might uh, put them off track in terms of managing the response? And maybe that's an issue UNHCR has to tackle as well. Is it a threat for them, like say, if I take the digital ID uh, topic, to be kind of uh, uh, not part of the response or being uh, maybe uh, uh, have their, their, their identity process being stolen by some kind of another institution? Is that an issue? In the case of UNHCR, we, we do the registration of the most vulnerable, uh, also the enrollment for cash assistance. So if you like that data, the data protection, data control is, is within UNHCR. We are the data owner. When we use uh, blockchain, so the blockchain is the data processor. And of course, there are, there are um, issues in the sense that what the regulator allows you to do especially in an emergency setting. And that also is the same for Lebanon. I know the Lebanon case very well. So in the case of Morocco, the government has also um, ideas how this now can actually, uh, you know, how we can conduct, conduct actually to reach the people. Um, we have seen uh, use cases of uh, crypto the first few days, already drop of crypto into wallets. So Morocco is, is, is a country where people are already quite well uh, equipped in, in, in crypto in general. And the key is now, you know, how we, we have uh, regulatory compliance and regulatory agreement to some extent, how to deliver that, that aid assistance in, in digital format, yes. 
If I may, I mean, you mentioned digital identity being, you know, I think that with blockchain, you return the ownership of digital identity to the individuals, which are the only one who should be in, you know, having their, the property of their identity. I would mention one example, which was done in Ethiopia, where, you know, the, the main problem of students in Ethiopia was, is not, you know, the small fraction of the population has a change to access studies, high school, university, and then they go find a job. When they find a job, their main problem is to prove that their diploma is right or is not fraudulent, or they are really the person who they claim they are. Because someone goes to another country, to the other side of the continent to get a job, how do they, how do they prove their identity? By triangulating having your identity through an NFT, in fact, or some kind of you know, unique ID, you triangulate with your smartphone, the one who receives you, download an app, scan the, scan the, smart, the, the QR code, then you know that this person is who he is, you know that this diploma is, is real. It's a very, very positive uh, addition to any government without having them to, de to deploy any kind of infrastructure. That's, that's a very uh, bringing back identity to individuals. Yeah, and if I can just add one more thing. Um, when you take the work that the government has to do off their shoulders, they usually tend to appreciate that. So in countries where things are you know, impossible to manage, um, assisting them with creating digital identities for folks. And this isn't a uh, public blockchain, of course. Usually it's a, it's a private blockchain. Um, an example of where we're doing this is, uh, and this is pertinent to real estate as well, especially in West Africa, uh, we've invested in a couple of solutions that fractionalize real estate holdings such that folks have access to real estate but at the same time have access to investment via real estate. So mixing digital identity with a lot of other use cases is a great opportunity for scalability and growth. We, we have run out of time. I will give a message maybe, because you still have time to engage with the fabulous curated uh, panel that we have. You can continue the discussion and your questions about education, empowering youth, about blockchain per se with, with Fred, with Carmen and what is she doing with UNHCR and managing technology, with Florian about assets and the future of finance, with um, Ahmed and also what Morgan is doing because we would, be, we would love to, to invite you for a quick apparel to the UNHCR, which is just like two minutes walking from here. And you can engage, learn a little bit more and you can enjoy some refreshments from a refugee-owned catering company. And so if you would like to join us, just follow us, and we can continue. One hour was too short, but uh, thank you very much for your fabulous listening skills. And I hope you have learned a little bit more. We can discuss at the UNHCR more use cases. I love to talk about space protection. So <laughs> thank you very much to all of you.